What's going on guys and welcome to my Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise tier list ranking. Now it's been a while since I've talked about this franchise. I re-ranked it and obviously reviewed the new film earlier this year, but I've got a nice video coming out on Thanksgiving Day, which is the 24th of this month for those of you that don't live in the U.S. It's one that I recorded back in September when I was in Austin, Texas, and me and Sean Chandler and Rudy from Gen X Reviews all went around to all of the shooting locations uh, that was near Sean's house of the Texas Chainsaw movies and one from the Friday the 13th remake. And so the Field Trip of Flesh video is going to be coming to you this Thanksgiving. 685, right there. Now it's trivia time. After they picked up the hitchhiker, where did the characters in the original film eat for lunch? Was it Wendy's or Popeye's? So to get us back into the groove of Texas Chainsaw and get primed for that video, I figured what better time than to talk about this franchise once again and add it to my list of tier list rankings. So the categories from best to worst are as follows. The saw is family, appetizing, edible, spoiled meat, and do your thing, cuz. So kicking it right off with the original film, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. This one is gonna be going up into appetizing for me. I know, I know, horror classic, best of all time. Yeah, I get all of that. Look, this is a movie that I have always said that I respect more than I actually enjoy. I totally get the legacy of this movie. I get that if you were there when it came out or if you saw it very early on in life or it had some kind of an effect on you, that why you would consider this a top tier horror film, totally get it. But it's one of those movies that I totally understand and respect the, the legacy of it, but it's just not a movie that I enjoy watching all that much. And it's certainly not a movie that I have much desire to rewatch all that often. I think it achieves everything it sets out to do. You know, Toby Hooper set out to make this very grim and grindhousey, almost exploitation movie. It did a little bit of commentary on like the Vietnam era in there. I don't necessarily pick up on that when I watch it, but it's there, so fair enough. I think he achieves all of that, but it's a movie that is so good at achieving the, the misery and the dirt and the grime and the nastiness that it's just not an experience that I necessarily love having all that often. So uh, a lot of really sick and twisted things going on here, a lot of sick and twisted characters. It's a movie that the deeper that you get into it, the more miserable it gets for this uh, main character, Sally Hardesty. And so it's kind of like a theme park ride where you're locked in and you're just kind of forced to watch all this depravity. And so uh, I get it. I get why it's one of those movies that has stood the test of time as this horror classic and one of the most influential movies in the horror genre in history. It's just not a movie that's ever been top tier for me. Really quick before we continue on in this tier list, if you're a man that does not want to spend the later part of his years using a leather face mask to cover up how dry and cracked and how poorly you took care of your skin throughout your life, definitely check out the sponsor of today's video, Tej Hanley. Tej Hanley has helped me to further develop a skincare routine that I can follow because it keeps things completely uncomplicated. And words can't describe what healthy skin can do for your self-confidence, especially when you spend all your time in front of a camera. Even just starting with their level one system gives you a daily face wash that helps to clean off all the dirt and grime, a two times per week exfoliating scrub to get rid of all the dead skin, an AM moisturizer to help protect your skin from the harmful effects the sun brings, and a PM moisturizer to make sure that your skin stays hydrated throughout the night. Go with level two to add in the AM PM eye cream or level three to add in this facial firming serum. And the uncomplicated complicated part comes in with this instruction card that comes with every single kit that tells you your daily and weekly routines so that you always know what to use and when to use and how much to use. And they have over 5,000 five-star reviews from around the world, so you can trust that they provide genuine quality. Become a member now and get 20% off retail price and the ability to customize your box, exclusive monthly deals, and you can pause or cancel your membership at any time. So be sure to check out Tej Hanley using the link in the video description below and save 30% off of your first order and receive a free gift. And thank you to Tiege Hanley for sponsoring today's video. Now we have the sequel, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre Part 2. And this one I'm going to stick in appetizing as well, right next to the original. Now there's times where I watch this movie and I like it more than the original. There's times where I watch it and I like the original a little bit more. Just depends on my mood. This is a much, much different film. Uh, it, it's more of a horror comedy. A lot goofier, a lot more slapstick, doesn't take itself near as seriously and tries to have fun with the grossness and the depravity. And so if I'm in the mood for that, I tend to enjoy this one a bit more because it's easier to actually enjoy. 
But if I'm not in the mood for the goofiness and how, how ridiculous it is, it sometimes can grate on my nerves a bit. So my experience is always a little different with it. Love the character of Chop Top. Love what Bill, Bill Mosley brings to it. Like having the characters back, like um, the cook and uh, having Leatherface back as well, even though it's not nearly as good of a version as Leatherface, gotta say. Uh, I like the character of Stretch quite a bit and what Caroline Williams brings to it. So I like her character. I like the way they continue off the first film of Dennis Hopper's character. It's kind of like this person set out for revenge for what befell Franklin and, and his sister Sally in the first film. So I think it's an entertaining movie. And you get Toby Hooper here that he always claimed that he made a horror comedy with the first film. And I guess all that shit just got lost in translation because I have never seen anything funny about that first film, nor have I met anybody that sees anything funny about that first film. Uh, so he kind of came back, was convinced to come back, and decided to make the film that I guess he thought he was making the first time with this. So this is a love or hate movie. People that tend to love the first one and hold the first one in high regard don't tend to like the goofier version, the goofier take in the second film. And I've known quite a few people, I think Kevin Smith even, likes uh, Texas Chainsaw 2 more than the first one. So totally depends on who you are. For me, it's up there in appetizing. Moving on to Leatherface, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. And this is going into spoiled meat. This is the most dull, unremarkable and boring movie in this entire franchise. And for as bad as some of these movies get, and for how offensively bad some of them get, boring is not necessarily a word I would use to describe any movie in this list except for this one. This is a film that every single time I talk about it, I have to go back and kind of look at the Wikipedia page and kind of refresh my thoughts on uh, the plot because I remember dick about this movie. Even the two times that I've seen it, days later, I don't remember shit. Like, what happened? It, just the same exact setup. Random characters find hillbilly people that are somehow a part of this massive statewide family. You get a couple of kills. You get, uh, especially here in the middle, you get an A-list actor in one of their first roles in Viggo Mortensen. That, that's kind of a cool thing in here. And, uh, yeah. End of list. I mean, like I said, Viggo Mortensen, that's cool. That's memorable for this first film. There's a neat little Rube Goldberg machine kill with this uh, upside down sledgehammer thing that's kind of neat and, and unique in this franchise for that. I like the saw that Leatherface has. And you get the man Ken Furry here. You get Joe Grizzly bitch in the movie. Other than that, everything else, boring, unremarkable, unmemorable. It's just dull. <laughs> it's just dull. There's nothing else I can say about this movie. I've already forgotten about it. Next up, we have The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation. And this is going to go and do your thing, because this is by a country mile the worst that this franchise has ever given. And I hope it's the worst this franchise ever gives, because this movie is an absolute train wreck. The only thing, the only single, solitary piece of mild, sick, twisted entertainment that you can get from this fucking thing is Matthew McConaughey's performance as Vilmer. If you want to see Matthew McConaughey go completely unhinged, off the rails, and just go absolute batshit fucking crazy in a movie where he's basically the only actor that knows the type of movie that he's in, then you're going to have quite a few scenes of him smacking himself in the head and shouting and running around with a mechanical leg and everything. Everything else about this movie is absolute dog shit. I mean, you got Renee Zellweger in here, another A-list actress getting her early break, and her character is not really anything to write home about, nothing interesting about her. The new characters that are implemented into this ever-expanding Sawyer family, not very interesting. You have the Leatherface in this movie is by far the worst version of Leatherface, and the least intimidating version of Leatherface. They lean, like, fully into the cross-dressing, transvestite style of Leatherface that was only, like, hinted at in the first movie where he was wearing, like, the mom face at the dinner table. And this movie just completely leans into that and ruins the character to where you lose all intimidation because he's running around screaming like a girl and you got, like, Renee Zellweger telling him to sit down and shut the fuck up, which just takes away any threat that he might have had. You got scenes where he's in, like, full drag, running around in makeup and, and lipstick and, and daylight and parking lots and stuff. It just, it doesn't work. It doesn't work whatsoever. It's not scary, and it's almost embarrassing for the character. And then you get to the end of the film, and they try to do this little 
loop back surprise to the first film where you get Sally Hardesty from the first film that's wheeled past them in the hospital. And I guarantee that 80% of the people that watched this movie had no fucking idea who that character was because it's quick and it's, you know, Sally Hardesty is not really that recognizable of a character for me. I've never seen her on too many Final Girl lists. And then they have this whole plot twist regarding the family working with the government, like the Illuminati or something. And just, what the? No. No. Don't watch it. Now we are at the Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake. And for those that have been following me for a while, know this is one of my favorite horror films of all time. And for me, this one is going right up into the Saw is family. Look, a lot of people had the experience that I had watching this movie for the first time in theaters when they watched the original film back in the 70s. I had not had any experience with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre films when I was 13 and saw this movie or any films like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie. So when I walked in, I was this clean slate. And so when me and my dad walked into the theater and checked this out in the dark with like maybe three other people in the theater, it genuinely scared the fuck out of us. And I can only count on maybe one hand how many movies have scared me. Uh, in my entire lifetime, not many at all. And so it's always stuck with me as a movie that just had this big impact. And I think it's easily the best in this entire franchise. It always has been for me. I think it's the best directed. It's got beautiful cinematography, so it's really well directed. Uh, it's really well acted as well. All the characters are good. There's no annoying characters. There's no Franklins in this movie. I think that all the villains, the, the Hewitt family this time, you got Arlie Ermey, who is arguably the most disturbing and scary character in this entire franchise, even over Leatherface. And the Leatherface we get in this movie is pretty fucking intimidating and imposing. Really good kills that doesn't go too gratuitous. It's effective without being like overly gory and disturbing and kind of leaning more into the torture side of things that was really prevalent in the 2000s. And uh, aside from some frustrations with her decision making throughout the movie, especially in the last half. I think that Jessica Beale's character is actually a really good front woman, a final girl, somebody that you can kind of follow and, and be invested in her journey and in her survival. And so this is a movie that I've just, I've always loved. I've always thought it was a damn good horror movie, a damn good remake, a damn good Texas Chainsaw Massacre film. And it is my favorite of this franchise. Probably always will be. Next you have The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Beginning, the prequel to the remake. And I'm going to stick this one in edible. I've never been that enamored with this movie. For as much as I love the remake and the characters involved and the concept of going back to that really appeals to me, I'm somebody that doesn't care much for prequels. You know, I say that out quite a bit, but this is one of the ones that's more egregious to me. One of my biggest pet peeves with a lot of prequels is that they tend to answer a lot of questions that I wasn't asking or giving me answers that I don't particularly care for. And all throughout this movie, you get these weird little Easter egg moments where they're like, oh, that's how the sheriff lost his teeth. Oh, that's how that guy lost his legs. Oh, that's how this little insignificant detail happened in the 2003 movie. And it's like, guys, I don't give a shit. <laughs> These are not interesting plot points to me. And so aside from that pet peeve and knowing where things are going to end up because it is a prequel, the other kind of Achilles heel to most prequels, I just don't find the characters in this movie to be as interesting or as engaging as the first film. You have these two brothers, one of which is uh, a vet. The other one is trying to draft dodge and the respective girlfriends and these bikers that they come, you know, in, into blows with at some point. And they all just get slaughtered one by one by this Hewitt family. The gore is cranked way up from the remake, which I actually think is not as effective. It, it's a bit too much. Not that it turns me off, but I, just, I think it was actually done uh, in a more tasteful and subtle way in the, in the original remake than it is in this movie. It's a bit... Uh, it's a bit exploitative in this one, and so I don't think that it's uh, nearly as effective at kind of putting you into the grime as the, the original one. And I, I don't think that uh, by the end of it, even though it kind of plays off of your expectations of the first film because it kind of mirrors the ending to a certain degree, I don't think it was all that surprising because it was kind of obvious what they were doing. So I've never been even that affected by the, call it, surprise ending of the movie. So I have fun with this one. It's fine. I could certainly enjoy watching it if I'm watching through these movies. This is not one that I would dread watching, but 
I've just never really been all that high on it. But I will say it has the best looking leather face. Whenever you get to the first kill where he literally takes the fresh skin off of that kid and puts it on his face and that right there is the best and scariest look of Leatherface we've had in this whole franchise. Now we're on to Texas Chainsaw 3D and despite not quite lining up with its signature catchphrase, I'm going to throw this one in spoiled meat. It's not good, but I don't think it's anywhere near as bad as Texas Chainsaw Next Generation. It's watchably bad. It's just, it's just a generic slasher film basically. So you have Texas Chainsaw 3D that uh, once again in this franchise is deciding to reboot, go back to the first film. And so you get this sequence at the beginning where Bill Mosley comes in and becomes Drayton and you have like this Devil's Reject style standoff at the beginning of the film that's going right off of the events of Sally Hardesty, the, the original film. And then it fast forward in time after the entire Sawyer family seemingly is killed off where Leatherface has been hiding out in this house and Alexander Daddario inherits this house and inherits Leatherface. And it, from there, it's just a generic slasher film in Texas with Leatherface as the killer. And so there, there's just nothing really all that interesting about it. It's just a very low-hanging fruit style horror film. But aside from all of that, even if they had executed a very low-hanging fruit style horror film, it could have still been very solid. But there's some hilariously bad execution in this film. Namely, this gigantic mistake or discrepancy regarding the timeline of this film. So you have the beginning of this that kicks off right after the events of the first film in the 70s. The baby that survives is Alexander Daddario's character. You fast forward to modern times and you have Alexander Daddario as the adult version of this baby. So either she's the most gorgeous and best kept up 40 year old I've ever seen in my life or somebody fucked up in the timeline. And you can't even tell me that it's supposed to be in the 90s because there's scenes later on in the film where people are carrying around cell phones for flashlights. And so it's hilarious. It causes this gigantic like uh, issue in the film to where just things don't make sense on a basic timeline issue. Things that you should not have to puzzle yourself over in a horror film. Then you have this whole element that's brought in about the law of the town kind of being the real bad guys and Leatherface maybe being this misunderstood anti-hero and it's like, guys, what the fuck are you doing? You don't do that to the signature slasher icon of your franchise ever, especially a character as depraved and nasty as Leatherface. Yes, he was always manipulated and kind of pushed into doing it for the most part, especially in that original film, but that dude is still evil as fuck. So right there, just a gigantic sin to do that to the, the signature character of your franchise. And then the dialogue that we get in this. Uh, I mean, you get Clint Eastwood's son, who is not doing anything noteworthy in this as kind of the, the main douchebag guy. And then you get that fucking line to where Alexander Daddario decides, you know what, I'm going to team up with Leatherface and throws him a saw and do your thing, cuz. Do your thing, cuz. That might be the low point. That might be the floor of this franchise, that that one singular line, that one moment, that might be it. Now we move on to Leatherface, the prequel to the original Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Again, we're going to reboot, go back to the original. Uh, and I'm going to stick this one in edible. I think that it's okay. I think that it's okay. You know, there's the basic concept of this movie to me is really interesting to where you are essentially having an origin story for your horror icon, but it's told in a mystery format to where we don't know what character that we're following is actually the character that becomes Leatherface. That idea in and of itself is really interesting. It could have been executed much better though. Because essentially what you have here is a group of characters to where there's only two possible answers for who could be Leatherface. You have this guy who's extremely nice and good hearted, looks nothing like Leatherface. And you have this other kid that is to a fucking T Leatherface. He is mentally inept. He doesn't talk really. He's bigger. He's got the build, the look, everything. 100% to a T Leatherface. And when you watch this knowing that they're intending this to be a mystery reveal and kind of a, a figure it out kind of a choose your own adventure style thing with who's going to end up being the slasher icon, well common sense tells you that the guy that is the most obvious fucking answer is probably not the answer. That's probably a red herring. 
And so immediately, you know it's going to be the other dude. And so it kind of destroys the whole concept right then and there. And I, I just think that that's really a shame. You know, the fact that they had to have a character that was just so on the nose Leatherface. When you could have had two characters that were equally uh, not like Leatherface whatsoever, and that mystery could have been intact. But for whatever reason, they decided not to do that. And so the entire core concept of this movie kind of falls on its face. If you could forgive that and go along for the ride, I still think that it has a lot of entertainment value for it. Uh, I think that the characters that you're following, especially the guy that ends up being Leatherface, is an interesting character, as well as like the, the, the girl that he's with that he eventually turns on in the, the last reel of the movie. I think seeing the Sawyer family in like their primitive years, like seeing Drayton and seeing the, the hitchhiker as kids, seeing the mom, the matriarch of the family was really interesting. Uh, so I, I like those elements to it. Those are prequel elements that I actually think were handled really well in this one. Steven Dorff's character on like this revenge kick was interesting to follow as well because you're kind of rooting for him even though he's full on fucking evil. Uh, the only other thing that they screw up on a bit too, and then we'll leave on that one, is that even after you get the reveal of the character that you figure out is going to be Leatherface, the journey of him starting to go on this path to madness is way too fast. And so he goes from really nice, good-hearted, moral character to fucking psychopathic murderer in, it seems like, five minutes. And so they don't necessarily earn that as well as they could have as well. Other than that, though, I, I just think it's, it's a solid enough movie. It's a solid enough attempt at doing something different in this franchise, of which you can't say that for very many of these movies. And finally, we have Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the 2022 Netflix film. And this one, I'm also going to stick in edible. It's fine. Totally watchable, low-hanging fruit style slasher film akin to Texas Chainsaw 3D. I think it's better executed than Texas Chainsaw 3D, but it's that same style of movie. It's let's take Leatherface, let's not really do anything interesting with him, let's just make him the, the bad guy that's going to chase around all these other stupid characters and dismember them one by one for 90 minutes. And if you're on board for that, it's got a, a lot of merit to it. There's a lot of gore. There's some entertainment value with setting up some of these characters to be absolutely insufferable and then watching Leatherface just dismember them one by one and getting a, a bit of sick satisfaction out of that one. Uh, the setup of the movie is somewhat interesting where you get Leatherface that's tried to carry on and live kind of free of the events of the first film. Uh, I, I think that there's even... Uh, there's even an interesting attempt at trying to have a commentary on like millennials and people that are ultra woke and SJWs, but not doing it in a way that feels like they're preaching. It's almost like they're the blunt end of the joke this time around. So that's an interesting change of pace that I appreciated. And like I said, plenty of gore, plenty of blood and guts. You have Leatherface that takes on an entire bus full of people at one point. So if you're not there for anything interesting in the narrative department or any interesting characters or any new fresh exploration of the Texas Chainsaw characters or lore, then uh, you know, if you're there for that, you're not getting a whole lot of it. If you're there for buckets of blood, it's got a lot here. It's got a lot that you probably appreciate. It was successful enough for them to announce that they're going to be doing more. They're going to get more of these types of movies on Netflix. And you know what? So be it. I'm entertained enough by it. It's not the most interesting thing you can do with these characters, but Every once in a while, if I get a, a quick, easily digestible little slasher movie with a big, bulky-ass leather face cutting dudes up, I'll probably be entertained by that every couple of years. Well, that's it for this one, guys. If you enjoyed this, please like and share and hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the field trip of flesh this Thanksgiving on the 24th. Be sure to check out Tej Hanley in the video description below and get that box with that discount and that free gift. Thank you so much for watching, and as always, remember, Opinions are like assholes, but that doesn't mean you have to be.